Good evening and welcome to tonight's Policy DC Pine. My name is Robert Dermel and I'm the Director of Operations for the Medical Institute of Policy Research. Tonight's event is in partnership with the Duff Robin Professor of Government at the University of Manitoba. To find out more about our institute and what we do, I invite you to go to our website at mipr.ca or check out the information at your tables. Last decade, governments across the country have seen their share of political leadership challenges. With the recent NDP, with the NDP leadership convention soon approaching, tonight's event will tackle some of the complexities around political leadership and what makes a good political leader. How does a leader bounce back from public mistakes? How do leaders gracefully exit? And a lot of rejuvenation of their city, province, country, and political party. Um, those are some of the questions that uh, we'll probably talk around tonight. Our moderator this evening is uh, Dr. Shannon Stafford, uh, Perspectives and Politics Editor at the Winnipeg Free Press. And our panel, uh, we have Dr. Paul Thomas, uh, Professor Emeritus at the University of Manitoba, Dr. David Stewart from the Department of Political Science at the University of Calgary, Dr. Kelly Saunders from the Department of Political Science at Granite University, and Mr. Curtis Brown, Vice President of Probe Research Inc. Their detailed biographies can be found with your welcome papers. Following tonight's event, I invite you to fill out your feedback forms. Many of our event ideas come from you. Um, so I'm going to pass the mic to Shannon and uh, enjoy the evening. Thank you. about leadership and certainly given the sort of life and times that we're living in in Canada and in Manitoba, I don't think we're going to have a more timely topic, that's for sure. So we're going to start, and we think we decided on, eight, on decisions of, um, of seniority, how's that? Uh, we're going to start with Paul Thomas, then we'll go to Dave Stewart, go to Kelly, and then we'll go to Curtis Brown. And I'm in this kind of enviable position because Dave Stewart taught me my very first Alberta politics class, and he almost got me out of jail once, which I thought was a really good thing. <laughs> Okay, we'll start with um, uh, Paul, and I have the, I'm the keeper of the timer, so I get to use the big broad hook if they go too long. Go ahead, Paul. Thank you, Shannon. Um, think of me as the warm-up act, uh, with the main attractions to follow. Uh, as the senior member of the panel, I refuse to do any heavy conceptual lifting, uh, and I know gymnastic analysis that we'll get from uh, Curtis Brown. So I have seven slides, and I've enlisted a, a beautiful assistant here, David Stewart. He will change the slide now. Could we start, Mr. Stewart? Professor Stewart, yeah, and go to the next one, please. Uh, and I'm going to try and breeze through these as uh, quickly as possible. The thought was that the thought was that I might uh, give some sort of basic uh, description of leadership and the debates around leadership, and then we might move into more concrete examples and. Uh, uh, if you take a look at the leadership literature, there are literally thousands of books and millions of articles on the topic, most of which are based on the experience in the corporate sector. There are relatively few, uh, unfortunately, books on, on political leadership that develop working models uh, of leadership uh, uh, and do empirical testing of those leadership theories. So we have a lot of different perspectives on how leadership is best understood and practiced, uh, uh, whether in the corporate sector, the nonprofit sector, or particularly in, in government. So uh, sort of sorting out those uh, numerous uh, streams of literature, there are broadly two schools of thought. One sees leadership as uh, a set of personal attributes that some lucky individual uh, by uh, uh, by reason of the genetic draw or something, have certain attributes or qualities that make them leaders. The leadership leaders are born, in other words. And the second view is leadership as an interactive process. And then, if you could change the slide, please. Uh, so uh, there. Uh, let me put this first. Uh, my perspective is that leadership is far more an interactive process than it is a set of personal attributes. And under my thinking, the uh, distinction between leaders and followers becomes blurred. And leadership involves, in, in other words, a two-way flow uh, of influence between leaders and followers. Um, and uh, that becomes important when you begin to talk about the human side of leadership and the interactive process that, that develops in leadership. Next slide, please. So when we turn to the political realm, uh, there are, uh, there is an ongoing relationship and process that involves two halves, in my view. 
this first the in, this in, set of institutional relationships where authority is distributed, there's control over resources, both material and symbolic resources, and there's the capacity to exercise prerogatives uh, of office uh, in order to wield uh, leadership power. This is the so-called hard power of leadership. The second half of political leadership involves skills of communication, listening, empathy, negotiation, bargaining, and persuasion. In other words, the capacity to cause people to voluntary, voluntarily change their minds and their behaviors. And this is so-called soft power. And obviously, these two levels of, of leadership are related, they're inter, uh, in, uh, interrelated, and uh, the control over the levers of power in government obviously helps with the other side of leadership. Next one, please, Dick. Uh, I think it was Machiavelli who said uh, back in 1532 in The Prince that a leader must have the, the fierceness of the lion and the craftiness of the fox. And uh, I think that that captures the fact that leaders must combine and balance both hard and soft leadership. In the con current contemporary political environment of the early 21st century, there are numerous pressures and demands and constraints on leaders, some of which are listed in the slide, which you'll see in a moment. Let me just uh, hit on a few of these. First, uh, governments and leaders operate in a more complicated, interdependent, and unpredictable policy environment. Secondly, there's diminished confidence in the capacity of governments and leaders to resolve seemingly intractable, intractable problems. Thirdly, there's perceptions of resource scarcity and a resistance to additional taxes. Uh, there's a lack of trust and confidence in politicians and political parties and political institutions. There's a more polarized, adversarial, and negative elite political culture, which is, operates all around the basis of naming, blaming, and shaming. There's a 24-7, instantaneous, multi-channel, aggressive media environment. There are more numerous and active interest groups and advocacy groups that place demands on government. And finally, there are laws that require and technologies that enable greater transparency and information sharing so that nothing remains confidential for forever and often is released prematurely. So governing itself may have become more centralized in the sense that decision making within government is often highly centralized, but the governance process, which is wider interactions between uh, society and government, has become more pluralistic, open, uh, and uh, uh, uncontrollable. Next one, please take There's a brand new book out that well, came out last year by Archie Brown, The Myth of the Strong Leader. A very important book, looks comparati comparatively at leadership in a number of different countries. Uh, at one point, Archie Brown, a UK political scientist, writes, good leadership requires many attributes whose relative importance varies according to time, place, and context. It should never be confused with overmighty power of overweening individuals. Brown uh, dismantles the myth that power equals strength and that strength guarantees positive outcomes. Being a leader of, uh, of a party and of a government is enabling. It gives you authority to make decisions, but there are also significant constraints. I was reading a, a Finnish woman political scientist, uh, Lori, uh, Carlton, who writes about the personalization of politics, the focus on the leader, and she says that in five democracies, including Canada, this trend that everyone seems to be agreed upon is much exaggerated. Leaders don't determine as much as we give them credit for, not even election outcomes. Next slide, please. Here's where I get closer to today's uh, realities here in the province of Manitoba. I want to stress the importance in a cabinet parliamentary system, particularly, of maintaining party unity. It's one of the key tasks of party leaders, and it's become more difficult than it was in the past, despite the, the effect of the seeming effectiveness of the control freak in Ottawa at the current time, Mr. Harper. But studies indicate that parties whose politicians openly feud are electorally harmed if voters are left with the distinct impression that internal divisions mean dysfunction 
and an inability to focus on the problems of the day. I've been reading several of those studies lately. This is especially true if the party in question is in government, if there are major party figures involved in this dispute, and if the feud involves a highly salient public policy issue like a major tax increase. So I'll finish with this point. Uh, I'll finish with this point. I think it's very important, based on past research I've done on cabinet and caucus unity, that we pay far more attention to the human side of politics. In this day and age, political scientists think of themselves as hyper-realistic, that they can see self-interest and political calculation and Machiavellian manipulations involved in every scene, and they can measure the distance people are from power. Uh, and uh, the media has give, become very, very cynical in interpreting the uh, motivations and intentions and, uh, and actions of politicians. I think there's another side to political life which is more positive. It's all, it, it is best interpreted through the lens of social psychology. Psychology, it's about belonging, it's about team play, it's about honesty, it's about uh, cooperation, it's about loyalty, trust, apology, and forgiveness. And I'm going to write about this, I'm going to interpret this, uh, these recent events in Manitoba through this lens and I'm going to try and interview people, and I may even try and get an op-ed piece published by Shannon Sanford of the Free Press. But I had so little success with her, I'm not going to write her. I'll end this. <laughs>